tried to share in the previous session, um, the, the spirit with, with which I want to work with you in this seminar. And um, uh, someone noticed that the cordon I have here uh, is a little bit uh, spoiled with the ink there. I want to say that in my travels, I never carry my Arabic cordon in my briefcase because that would be considered disrespectful by my Muslim friends. So what I have in my hand here is an English interpretation of the Quran. It is not the Quran. In Muslim understanding, all translations are only interpretations. It is only Quran in Arabic. So I do not carry an Arabic Quran with me because that would be considered disrespectful. To put in my briefcase with other books you see, or in this case, this English translation even became a little bit damaged by some ink. And I should get another one because I don't, this, this is not so good to have one that is damaged that way. But this is not the Quran. It's only an English translation of it. I also have in my hand a Bible. And the Bible is an English translation. As Christians, we do translate the scriptures into languages everywhere as possible. And so we, we carry our Bibles with us, which are translations of the Word of God. Um, but with, with Muslim understanding, uh, any time it is translated into another language, language, it is not the authentic Quran. It is an interpretation. It's important as an interpretation, but it is not an authentic Quran. Um, now, I want to say a word about uh, my journey with Muslims, which is a background for what I'll be sharing with you these, these several weeks. And uh, much of what I share comes out of my walk with Muslims, including many very dear Muslims as friends of mine. And that friendship with Muslims began in 1963, when my wife, Grace, and our two little daughters, Doris, two months old, and Karen, two years old, left the United States for Somalia. When I grew up in Tanzania, uh, I never met Muslims. We worked among a, a people who were committed to African traditional religion. It was not Islam. Um, and so as I believed that God was calling me into world missions as a little boy, it never occurred to me that that might be to walk with Muslims as a follower of Jesus and bearing witness to Jesus. I didn't, it, never, it never occurred to me that might be the case. And so when my wife, when Grace and I married in the United States, in 1959, after our graduation from university, we were in prayer as a couple as to where God would want to take us in a commitment to mission. And um, I thought perhaps it would be Tanzania, where I grew up, and I would teach in the theological college there. But uh, that door did not open. And so we were discerning with our church, where should we be serving? And um, uh, our, our mission, Eastern Mennonite Missions, uh, was involved in Somalia, which was a 100% Muslim country, also in Eastern Africa. And uh, uh, as the gospel was being sown in that setting, why a number of Somalis became believers in Jesus. And, um, and they were, in fact, baptized. And that, of course, oftentimes brings particular stresses into the Muslim community. For the conviction is that the Muslim community should function in a way that people do not um, leave Islam to embrace another faith. And uh, that brought some conflict into the situation in Somalia. And these new believers conducted themselves in ways that were not wise. I don't mean this critically, but uh, they gave out tracts <laughs> in the streets of the capital city beside the principal mosque in the city. And that led to uh, much, much concern um, in the Muslim community. And one of the consequences was that the director of the mission uh, was killed in, uh, in the concerns. Um, and uh, the whole government, the society, was appalled at what happened. The one who did this was taken to court and put in prison. He's not at all supported by the Muslim leadership. He acted completely alone. 
but out of his uh, concern about Somalis becoming believers in Jesus the Messiah. And the Lord used that to speak to my wife and I, my wife and me. And um, shortly thereafter, our mission asked if we would go to Somalia to replace that couple. And we knew that this was God's appointment. And so uh, with joy um, and also um, a deep sense of call, we left the United States to go to Somalia to join our mission there. And we were very, very welcomed. Um, and I remember when I arrived in the Mogadishu airport, uh, that's the capital city of Somalia, I was impressed with how God permeated, an awareness of God permeated this culture. For I heard the name God, Allah, uh, uttered perhaps a thousand times or more <laughs> during our going through customs and immigration, you know. The name God just permeated the air. It was a very God-aware culture, much, much more so than the culture I came from in the United States, where there was an awareness of God, but not permeating the culture in the way that God awareness permeated Somali culture. And so we were not there to introduce uh, the notion that there's God the creator. The Somalis believe that absolutely. Um, and so that was the beginning of my immersion in Islam. Just the Mogadishu airport and the, and the, and, and the word God being, being expressed in so many, many ways. And then uh, we would go to the tea shops in the evening. Actually, the men would go. Women did not go to the tea shops, but we men would go and sit in the tea shops. And again, the conversations in the tea shops inevitably turned to God talk. Uh, you just could hardly meet with a Somali uh, Muslim without God taking the center of the conversation. So um, it, was, um, it was a very um, um, amazing situation for me to be immersed in Islam and immersed in this God awareness, which was so typical of the Somali situation. We were welcomed, as I say, uh, uh, with, with great appreciation by the Somali people, um, and they defined uh, the ministries we should be involved in. We didn't go in projecting, we'll do this for you and we'll do this for you, but rather is, what do you want us to do? Uh, how can we serve you as your guests in this country? And they defined very quickly education. Uh, we, uh, we do not have um, adequate secular educational uh, programs in this country. English is an international language. We would like to have English language schools. And so we began schools, first of all, adult English, and then elementary through high school. And our schools became a model for um, um, excellent secular education. And that opened doors. Also, they wanted uh, us to get involved in um, medical work. And so we developed a hospital and then a clinic and, and, and Again, very well received. Oh my, even today, when I meet with Somali people, as I did just last February in Somaliland, and I say to them, I'm with the Somalia Mennonite Mission, they say, wow, that's good, you see. <laughs> they greatly appreciated our involvement. And then we got involved in agricultural development. Again, very much affirmed and appreciated. However, the environment was very restrictive. Uh, in terms of sharing faith. Um, uh, we were, according to the Constitution, it was illegal to propagate Christianity. Only the true faith of Islam was to be propagated throughout the country. And we built these schools, I mentioned, and uh, put a lot of good Mennonite money into developing these schools. Well, the laws required in time this didn't happen right away, but soon laws were passed, which required that Islam be taught in these schools that we had built, uh, with government teachers coming into the schools to teach. And uh, that was a struggle for us. A sister mission, I won't name the mission, but a sister mission with another denominational group decided to leave the country rather than to accept that Islam be taught in the schools. We felt, however, as we prayed and discerned the mind of the Spirit, and listened to the counsel of the Somali believers. By this time, there was a little fellowship of believers had come together. 
And uh, the believers strongly encouraged us to accept this requirement. For they said, um, the gospel is not bound. Uh, we don't need to use political and control or even control of our schools to um, uh, effectuate uh, bearing witness to the gospel. Um, so let's, let's cooperate. We're, you're here as guests of the country. And so guests don't determine their agenda. Guests serve as they are asked to serve. So if you're invited to serve in this country by schools, and then a requirement is that Islam be taught, uh, let's, not, let's not fight against, let's cooperate. And um, our mission in the States spent a day of prayer and fasting, and on their knees in prayer discerned that they will, they will accept this requirement. And so Islam was taught in our schools. That was an enormous step in trust building, for it became very clear to our Muslim friends that we're not there to fight against Islam. Uh, we're there to serve in the spirit of Jesus, our, the Messiah, and um, to uh, bear faithful witness as, uh, as doors open, but not to control, not to fight. Uh, we're there to cooperate as servants. And it, it greatly, greatly built uh, trust. It was the right decision, I do believe, I'm sure. Um, although the situation was very restrictive, the Holy Spirit was not bound. And uh, quite occasionally, uh, students or others would come to our doors at night and ask for us to b have a Bible study with them, where they would say, we are interested in learning more about the Messiah whom you honor and whom you um, follow. And so little fellowships of believers developed uh, during those years in Somalia. Unobtrusive, uh, but everybody knew that they were present. Um, it was just a quiet work of the Spirit of God as these fellowships developed. Let me illustrate uh, how the Lord would work. Uh, one day, I was invited into the home of the district commissioner uh, at the town where I was working at Johar in Somalia. And he said to me, um, I understand that some of the students in the school where you are serving are becoming believers in Jesus the Messiah, and it's against the law. I want you to know I'm doing an investigation, and when I learn the whole truth, I'm going to take actions to make this stop. And he was quite angry. And so I prayed, Holy Spirit, uh, the Lord has promised that at times like this, you'll, share, you'll, you'll tell me what to say. So hurry up and uh, help me know what to, how to respond. I said to the district commissioner, may I respond to your charges? He said, of course you may. The place was full of people, so I didn't want uh, a riot or anything. So I said, I'd like to just respond in the presence of, of one or two witnesses. So I asked everybody to go out of the office except the chief of police. And then I said, I will not comment on whether Somalis are becoming, at the school, are becoming believers in Jesus or not. Um, you do your investigation and you come to your own conclusion. Only God knows the heart of a person. So I won't comment on that. But I said, I have a big problem and I need your advice as what to do. I said, years ago, uh, when I believed in Jesus the Messiah, the Spirit of God filled my soul with love and joy and peace, and I cannot destroy that gift. It's right at the center of my being. And occasionally, students will come to me and they will say, we see within you the gift of joy and love and peace, and we know it has to do with your faith in Jesus. We also want to believe. We also want to investigate. What can I do? Can I lock the door on, their, on them and say, no, you cannot believe? What if you would want to believe? Could I or the government prevent you? Are you not free? I said, I have a problem, and I need your counsel. And he looked at me. They called me Daoud Sheikh, Daoud Sheikh with my Somali name. Daoud, David, Sheikh meaning uh, the man of God. Sheikh, the Sheikh, Daoud Sheikh. He said, Daoud Sheikh, you are doing very well. Continue as you are doing. No further investigation. Um, that, that, was, that was the way in which we worked in Somalia. Restricted, but the Holy Spirit not bound. We called these people Nicodemuses, who would come at night asking quietly for um, a Bible or for a Bible study. 
and who would come to faith in Jesus, and little fellowships of believers were formed. We viewed our, um, our um, schools and medical programs and so forth as what we called signs of the kingdom. Signs of the kingdom. You know, when Jesus was here, he went around doing good. And uh, these good deeds that Jesus did were referred to as signs of the kingdom, you see. Healing the sick, uh, you know, uh, feeding the hungry and so forth, signs of the kingdom. And so we viewed our schools as signs of the kingdom. We could not openly proclaim the gospel, but we could do good deeds. And those good deeds were, as Paul says to the Corinthians, a letter from heaven, signs of the kingdom. So people would not read the Bible oftentimes, but they would read our lives. And they would see in the good deeds that we were doing, signs of the kingdom. And uh, those signs of the kingdom helped, helped to provide space for the church, you see. Wow, if this is what the kingdom is about, of those who follow Jesus faithfully, it's really good, you see. And that conviction of the goodness of these signs of the kingdom helped to provide space for the church and also um, were an ongoing invitation to the Somali people to investigate this Jesus who brings about these signs of the kingdom through the life and ministry of, of our mission there in Somalia. Um, so it was a very, very good, a very good uh, years we had in Somalia. Um, and little fellowships of believers emerged, which gave us much, much joy. My wife and I believe that we should invest our lifetime in this uh, Somali journey, for it was clear that the misunderstandings between Muslims and Christians, uh, the misunderstandings and misperceptions in regards to the gospel run so very, very deep that it's not just the sort of thing you address in a day or a year or two years or three years, that it really takes a lifetime of engagement with Muslim people, addressing the mistrust issues and uh, the suspicions and so forth. Um, and so we believe that, that we, we should be, continue our involvement in Somalia for a lifetime. And so it was very surprising to us and deeply disappointing when after 10 years we needed to leave. Um, interestingly, it was not the Muslims who sent us out of Somalia. Uh, in 1959, 1969, there was a, a communist, a Marxist coup d'etat in Somalia with a revolution. But what had happened was many of the upcoming military officers had gone to the Soviet Union for their training, and then they returned to Somalia. And these Soviet-trained military officers staged a military coup d'etat. And so a Marxist-Leninist uh, government uh, took root in Somalia with very strong Soviet backing. And the Soviets were not happy about Westerners being in the country. And so slowly, slowly, Western agencies and organizations were pushed out. Peace Corps, first of all, then West German agencies and so forth. And last of all, as I recall, the last of all was the Somalia Mennonite mission. We were asked uh, finally to leave as well. And many, many Somalis saw us leave with great regret. Uh, they longed that we could stay but it came clear we needed to go. And so uh, my wife and I moved from Somalia now to Kenya. Now, there's where we need our map. So here's Tanzania where I was born, where I grew up, you see. And here's Somalia. It's referred to as the Horn of Africa. And then there is Kenya to the south of Somalia. Now, Somalia, 100% Muslim. Kenya, 80% Christian, you see. Two very, very different situations in regards to faith, you see. And um, however, Kenya was 7% Muslim. 7% were Muslim, 80% Christian. And so when we moved to Kenya, we moved, we, went to the, we moved to the city of Nairobi, which is the capital of Kenya, and we chose to move into the Muslim area of the city, um, the predominantly Muslim area of the city, which was also predominantly Somali. So when we moved to Kenya, um, we settled into the Somali Muslim area of the city to continue our involvement with Muslim people. Now, in, um, and, and, the, and it was called Eastleigh. This part of Nairobi was referred to as Eastleigh.
Um, and there was a, a, a couple of main thoroughfares going through, the, through, through Eastleigh. And then you had these side streets. And there was a side street which had a dead end. It was called 8th Street. Amazingly, on 8th Street, there was an apartment complex being built, which had apartments for five families. And this was just across the street, catty corner across the street, from the 8th Street Muslim Mosque. We were able to rent that entire apartment complex. And so we became a Christian community right across the street from the 8th Street Mosque, you see. And this 8th Street Mosque was a Sufi mosque. We'll talk more about that later in the course, what Sufism is. But Sufis are Muslim communities who have a great yearning to know God and to be a people of peace. And so that's the heart of the Sufi movement within Islam, to know God and to be a people of peace, you see. Now, Islam is also committed to being a people of peace. But the Sufis want to push that very far. Uh, many Sufi communities are even nonviolent, you see. Um, so this, this Sufi community uh, um, was right across from, from this center where we were living. And we tried to, we tried to be like a, a Christian Sufi community, a people who know God and who are people of peace, and a community, an interracial, interethnic community of peace and reconciliation. All of us were Christians living there. Somalis, uh, Bantu, Caucasians, Kenyans, uh, Somalis, Ethiopians, uh, Canadians, Americans, you see, living together in this community, again, as a sign of the kingdom. That turned out to be a very, very good move. Um, and um, uh, then, working with the Baptists, we developed a sister, Sufi, a sister Christian community out in northeastern province of Kenya, which was a predominantly uh, Somali Muslim as well. And so we had these two centers out here in, in the northeastern province of Kenya, which was Somali, and then here in Nairobi. And so these were sister communities. Uh, again, signs of the kingdom, working together side by side with the Sufis. When the Imam would become ill, I would go over and have prayer for him. We would often invite the leaders of the mosque to our home. We would sit together and have meals together and dialogues together um, as we talked together about faith and, um, and the issues that unite and divide us as Christians and Muslims, building respect with that Muslim community. And as happened in Somalia, a small fellowship of believers developed there in Nairobi as well. Um, and we asked the community, in what ways could we serve you most effectively? And guess what they said? A reading room. We'd like to have a reading room. Eastleigh was a very congested, a very congested area of the city, and uh, students at night couldn't go home to read and study because the home was filled with little children, you see maybe eight people in one little room, that sort of thing. They said, we'd like to have a reading room. So we developed a reading room there. And then eventually, uh, we developed an entire uh, community center, buying land on either side of those apartments where we were, and developed a full-fledged community center, which today offers uh, courses in gymnastics and in, liter in literacy, in domestic science, um, and just a whole variety of ministries from that center. But at the heart of it is this reading room where every night of the week, hundreds of students come together and study quietly uh, for their final examinations and their classes that they're taking in high school or university. It was a very significant contribution to the community and a contribution that developed because the communities of Muslims in that area of the city said, this is what we need most of all. Those were very good years living in Eastleigh. And I was teaching at the university. By that time, I had my doctorate. And so I was employed at the university to teach in the Department of Religious Studies. And uh, one section of the department, of course, was teaching Islam. And a the Muslim professor called Badru Katarega and I became very good friends. 
In fact, for a couple years, I taught the world religions courses in the department. And for a couple years, Baldu Katarega and I team taught together world religions. So we would have dialogue in class as we taught together. And it was very, very feisty, very, very interesting, very dynamic, those engagements in dialogue. Um, and so out of our friendship, we wrote a book called A Christian and a Muslim in Dialogue. And it's in Russian and will become a textbook in this class as soon as they arrive. They're on the way, I'm told. But um, this book here, A Christian and a Muslim in Dialogue, I think it's now in about 12 languages. And it has opened many doors for me and for Katarega to be involved in dialogue between Muslims and Christians. Um, I get invited by Muslims occasionally to be involved in dialogues with them. It's this book that opens the door, like those dialogues I had in the United Kingdom that I told you about earlier on. Why did they invite me? Primarily, it was this book. It was the spirit with which I worked in this book. The first half of the book, Katarega shares his faith with me, and I respond to each chapter, 12 chapters. The last half of the book, I share my faith with him, and he responds to each chapter as a Muslim. And so it's a very gentle give and take, each one trying to be faithful to the community of faith he represents and respectfully sharing our faith with one another. And as I say, this has opened many, many doors. It was a God thing that this developed there in Kenya. And the other thing that we developed while in Kenya, and I'll talk more about this later on in the course, was a Bible study course for Muslims called The People of God. Uh, and I won't take long to talk about that now because I'll talk about it later on. But just to mention that we spent about four years while we were there in Kenya developing this course. It's a four-course series, and, and uh, we took it into the Muslim communities to have them assess it and critique it. We, we, uh, we modified it in light of their critique. And today, I think it's in 45 languages and uh, being used all around the world with, I suppose, every year, tens of thousands of Muslims taking this course. And as far as I know, there has been no objection to this course by the Muslim communities because as they take this course, they see that the gospel is really good news and it is contextual. We attempt to communicate the good news in a way which builds bridges and does not create walls. So that was also another development of our time in Nairobi, Kenya. And we were very grateful as well that during that time, the Lord called forth a fellowship of believers. And one of the brothers in that fellowship of believers was called Ahmed. And years later, he returned to Nairobi and became one of the pastoral leaders of the growing fellowship of believers there in Nairobi. That vision for that fellowship of believers was planted way back there in 1973 when we moved to Nairobi from, uh, from Somalia. And this Ahmed joined us there in that, in that developing fellowship way, way back there many, many years ago. He is now suffering from cancer. And unless the Lord intervenes dramatically, the Lord, it seems, will be calling him home before long. But we still pray and continue to pray in hope and faith that the Lord will raise him up and that he can continue his ministry in Somalia. But he's become a very, very dear friend to mine, of mine and there, of ours, and there in, in, in Kenya is where that fellowship uh, developed, um, which was very, very special. So that's a little bit my story in terms of the involvement with Muslims. Uh, getting back to the States then, I've continued the involvement getting into mosques quite frequently um, and developing many friendships among Muslim people in the United States. And I work internationally, uh, getting invited into countries like Kosovo or even Iran recently with others, being involved in dialogue with Muslim theologians and so forth. And those open doors had very much related to this book, this dialogue. Seeking to um, give account of the hope that we have but with gentleness and with respect. So as we work through this seminar these days, I'll be drawing from some of that experience. I'm a learner. I'm not an expert, I assure you. I'm a learner as, as, as are all of us, aren't we? So I don't come into this as an expert, but as a fellow traveler with you, seeking to be faithful and uh, just sharing some of what I've heard and experienced over the years in this journey with Muslims who have become very dear friends of mine.